guys, thank you. Thanks for that really, really kind, warm welcome. You give me courage to get up here when you do things like that, so keep it coming. I have, I have a bit of a soft spoken voice, so if I put you to sleep, somebody just start shouting in the crowd, do something to wake everybody up, because I do have that kind of voice I've been told that kind of just, hey, lulls, could lull you calmly to sleep. So I'm hoping that's not gonna happen. I've got my preaching shoes on tonight. You gotta check these out. If you know my husband, so I don't, did Andrew say? I don't know. I'm married to Sean, who speaks on the weekends. So if you come on the weekends, you've seen Sean, and you know he's a shoe guy. So by default, I'm a shoe girl. And I had to, Sean's out of town, so he's not here. So I had to take pictures of my shoes. He actually, he got these for me. He got them right, he got them before I knew I was even going to be here tonight. And um, so I put them on. I took pictures and I said, babe, I'm wearing my preaching shoes. And he responded with three fire, hot, hot, hot emojis. And then tonight, the awesome guys over here right away said your shoes it's like oh my goodness I got it right so guys thank you the fact that I'm in my preaching shoes gives me a little bit of confidence to come up here okay so I have to say first and foremost thank you thank you to the amazing young adults team you guys have pastors and pastors Andrew and pastor Connor and Aaron they love you they are constantly looking for ways to help you flourish and thrive. They're constantly looking for ways to bring Jesus to you and new elements and aspects of his character so that you have what it takes to live this life well. And I just want to say thank you. This is actually my very first time speaking to the young adults. So, and I am excited I'm really excited because, number one, you are all in just a, a season of life where you're ready. You're ready. You're ready for the adventures that God has in front of you. There's so many unknowns right now. I know that. But you are ready. And I, re I believe that most of you are here because you really do want to live your life with Jesus at your side, and you want to walk forward with him as a part of your life. Some of you are here because you're scoping and hoping. That's okay. This is the best place to do it. I did it too. I'm not going to lie. I am a church girl, and I was constantly scoping and hoping. I don't do that anymore, but I did. So it, it, it works, guys. It really does work. So keep coming back. But then I love I love this young adult's age group and place in life that you are, and I'm excited to be here tonight because you're at a place where, my goodness, you are surrounded by opportunities to influence. They're everywhere. And so I, knowing where you're at in life, I actually, I'm, I'm not going to lie. When Andrew asked if I could do this or if I would come, I got real excited, and then all of a sudden, knowing the, the, the pressure that um, comes with, I, I so desperately wanted, you to bring, wanted to bring to you tonight just a message full of wisdom and full of insight and perspective, and I wanted to say all these fun, cool things that get you excited and ready to go out and conquer the world, and just knowing the place that you're at in life filled me with suddenly this pressure of, oh my goodness, Lord, what am I going to say? Like, what do I really have to say? And if I'm being completely honest, it takes me a really long time to put my thoughts to words. In fact, fun, true story, when Sean and I first started dating, we were in that place in life where, you know, we're uber flirtatious, and I'm doing and saying things that I would never really do and say. I mean, not do, like, I was a, I was a good girl. I was. I was a good girl, and he was a good, he was good to me, and he, he was good, okay? Like, like, he didn't try things, okay? Guys, don't try things on the girls. Just don't, okay? But I was like, this is the story. We'll just get there. We left 
church, we were leaders in our youth group. We were young adults leaders. It was youth and young adults. And so as young adult leaders, we were leaving church on a Wednesday night, driving separately. He was coming over to hang out because that's what we did. We hung out. We hung out. Anyway, he's coming over. We pull up to the stoplight, him in his car, me and mine. Window goes down, and he says, he looks over, and he says, hey, last one home has to buy the other ice cream. Well, I am not a competitive person, but of course, I wanted to look cute and cool, so I'm like, okay, you're going to lose. I lost, okay? He raced home. However, I got pulled over for speeding. Yeah. And... The officer, right away, at first he gives me a ticket, gives me the talk, gives me a ticket, and then right away he says, who were you following? Well, again, guys, it takes me a long time to put my, what did I say? To put words to thoughts? Yeah, see, you're going to see it tonight. Thank you. So right away I just went, a friend. He said, who is your friend's name? Sean. What's your friend's last name? Johnson. Where does your friend live? I gave the officer Sean's address. I don't even know how I knew Sean's address, but I did. I gave it to the officer and his phone number, guys, because the officer asked. So officer and I, we're, he, he finishes giving me my ticket. He follows me to my house where Sean is parked in front of my house. He pulls up behind Sean, turns his lights on, and gives Sean a ticket. You guys... Sean was so mad. This is the first time I'd seen him, like, really, really mad. He wasn't mad that he got a ticket. He wasn't mad at the officer. He was mad at me. He came and he said, Jill, why did he know all of my information? He, he asked. He said, Jill, he knew my address. I said, he asked. I didn't know what to say. And I can't lie to him. So I gave him all of Sean. I said, I'm sorry. Well, he, and, and he gave Sean a ticket. And Sean was so mad. He's like, Jill, I don't even think that's legal because he didn't get my speed on the record. He got your speed on the record. So needless to say, we did not get any ice cream that night. It has, Sean is, you know, he has, is, if you've seen, he's, he's quick with his words. He has no trouble, whereas me, it takes forever. So it's caused us some issues along the way. And I, and, and yeah, so all of that to say, I, it, it takes me a long time sometimes to go, okay, what am I going to say? And Andrew asked just before we were heading into a vacation with our kids to Disney World, not the easiest place to hear from God. It's so loud, and it was so wonderfully exhausting. But I, I just, the whole week, as we're riding rides at Disney, I'm saying, God, what do I talk about? What do I talk to the young adults about? God, what do I do? What do I do? What do I say? And we had one day where we had nothing planned. And so on that day, I thought, okay, I'm going to go out. It has been, we were staying at Animal Kingdom Lodge because it had been our dream. I should say it had been my dream for a long time. Since the boys were little, I always wanted to take them to Animal Kingdom Lodge. So that's where we stayed. And one morning, I go outside sitting on our balcony because I feel like I'm closer to Jesus when I'm outside. And I'm overlooking this pretty savanna, and I am and there's animals, and it's just, I'm in my happy place. The kids are inside playing video games, and I'm just outside by myself. And I said, God, what do I talk to the young adults about? What do I say? No joke. You may have seen this on social media already, but I'm gonna, if you haven't, you're going to see it now. Otherwise, I'm going to show you again. But watch this video. It's kind of fun. What's going on this morning? Sitting outside, telling God thank you while overlooking the savanna, also asking God what I should talk to the young adults about. And no kidding, there's someone writing Trust Jesus in the sky with an airplane. I don't know what that's about, but I'm going to take it. So, it's going to be a good night at Young Adults this week, folks. Next week. <laughs> that's awesome. Trust Jesus. Okay, so it gets better, okay? I was, like, mesmerized by this airplane art, so I just kept watching. And then this. Show this picture. I said, oh, my goodness. I go, Sean, I think it's saying Jill. Trust Jesus. 
he's rolling his eyes at this point. And of course it didn't. It ended up saying, Jesus loves you, big you, because I guess it's hard as an airplane artist to write the whole word. So, but I, I, I was thinking about that statement. I went back and I was just so, and that's kind of me, like the little things. I'm like, oh, Jesus. Like I just see Jesus in a lot of things that everybody else probably goes, no, that's, no, it's airplane art. A guy's having fun and he loves Jesus. But I started to think about that message. And in the moment, I thought, well, this is what I need. I need to just trust Jesus. I need to trust him that he's going to give me the words. But then I thought, well, that's silly. Kind of like where I was going, Jill, it doesn't say, Jill, trust Jesus. This message is not just for you. It's for everybody. And it is a very simple message, trust Jesus. But I feel like, and, and so I went back and forth. Because I thought, oh, I want to talk to the young adults about trusting Jesus in the journey. And I went back and forth and thought, no, that's, it's so simple. It's so churchy. It sounds so churchy. And if I'm being honest, I don't like churchy. I want authentic. I want real. I feel like we all do. We don't want churchy. We want real. But this week, no joke, in a book that I'm reading by Lisa Bevere, in my own quiet time, I read this. She said, you may say it's all too simple. Human nature is often drawn to the difficult and complex, but I find God most often in the pure and simple. And so I thought, you know what? That's it, God. I'm going to talk to the young adults about trusting Jesus because here's what I feel like. I feel like the best that I have to offer you as a group of young adults is I I have some stories, stories of encounters with Jesus, I, I love Jesus so much. Like, I love him, and I don't say that to brag about me. I just, I want that. It's, it's, like there, it's like there's a deep well in my heart of love for Jesus, and I want that to spill out and over and into your lives. And I want your lives to be changed and impact, impacted and drawn to Jesus because I want you to recognize he I feel like the staff makes fun of me a little bit for saying this. I heard they did this at a, at a um, Christmas staff party that I wasn't at because I had back surgery. But they were like, you're so loved, imitating me. But it's true. Like, I, I love Jesus, and I want that to spill over into your life because I want you to know he loves you, and I want you to use this time in your life to get as close to him as you possibly can. And I will tell you, just so that you can't, I don't want you to feel guilty. I don't want you to feel bad about yourself. I will tell you that I have not the depth of the love that I have for Jesus. It hasn't always been this deep, if that makes sense. It's, I can't, when I, years ago, um, it was different. Like I could say, I love Jesus, but it just wasn't as rich as deep it's been something that god did deposit in my heart a love for him when i said yes to him years ago but it's something that's grown steadily and slowly little by little by little over time and that's what i have to offer you tonight i know that this room is full full of people who've been hurt you've suffered loss You've suffered at the hands of disappointment, and I hate that. I hate that. I wish it wasn't the case, but I want to stand here and say to you, I hope that as I share, I'm going to take some time tonight. I'm going to share some stories. There's going to be lots of stories, so hang in there with me. But I hope that as I share these stories, I hope that something inside of you wakens, stirs, moves, your heart to a place where you can say, you know what? I want more of Jesus. I want to know him better. I want to know him in a richer, deeper way. And I want to naturally be able to say, whether I feel like it, whether I believe it or not, Jesus, I trust you. So story time. Stories of God's faithfulness, little at a time. Um, I figured I'd just kind of start at the beginning, sharing my 
my personal story, some of it. We'd be here forever, and we can't do that if I got into everything. But when I, I really do not remember a time in my life without knowing that Jesus wanted a relationship personally with me. I was seven. I went to a vacation Bible school with a friend, and they talked about um, God sent his one and only son. His name was Jesus. He loves you. He died for you. He wants to be a part of your life. Well, I'm sitting next to my best friend at the time. Her name was Sarah, and she they gave the invitation. If you want Jesus, you come forward. Sarah wanted Jesus. I just wanted to sit there. But Sarah said, Jill, let's go. Let's go give, let's go up. They're calling us up. And I didn't want to go because I, I was, I didn't really understand. And I was really timid, really shy. And I did not like being in front of people. I didn't want to have to walk up in front of all the other kids who were there. So I kind of said, no, Sarah, no. She talked me into it. That's another, I am a people pleaser. So I said, all right. Sarah, let's go. So we went, we gave our lives to Jesus. Again, I don't, I mean, really, I think God knew in that moment. I didn't understand really what I was doing, but he kept his hand on my life from that moment on. I'm going to fast forward a bunch, bunch, well, so eventually my parents, (laughs) sorry, I did, I'm all over the place. Eventually, my parents got to that place where they too, they said, you know what, we want Jesus. They got us into a church and where relationship with God was taught, and there I stayed. But it wasn't really until I got into my college years that my relationship with Christ really began to develop and take shape and take root. And while I was in college, I, I got involved in a relationship that I knew I shouldn't be in, and it was very unhealthy. But uh, I tried several times to get out of it, and I just never could pull myself out of it. It was one of those moments in life where I knew, Jill, you're not supposed to be here. You're not supposed to be in this place. And I went home. It was fall break. I went home for the weekend, and I went outside to my parents' backyard because, like I said, I feel closest to Jesus when I'm outside. And I just, in that moment, I said, God, This relationship doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel healthy. I don't think I'm supposed to be in it, but I can't get out of it. I need your help, God. If you want me out, I need you to do it because I can't do it myself. No kidding. That was a weekend. I go back to school. That day I got back, the guy broke up with me, which I know. I was like, whoa, God, that happened fast. (laughs) I wish I could say all prayers are answered that fast, but we all know that's just not the case. So one of those moments, one of those God moments where I saw him working, moving on my behalf. Fast forward, I finish school, ready to be done. I'm now at this place in life where it's time to embark on my career. Where am I going? What am I doing? You know, I really wanted, my heart was in this place of really wanting. I kept saying, God, I want to be in the center of your will. I want to be in the center of your will. I want to be there. Now I know, side note, the center of God's will is positioning yourself in relationship with him. That is the center of his his will for your life. It's there. It's loving him and then loving people. That is his will for your life. He has other plans, yes. But at the time, I was so, I just was so afraid, too, of making a mistake. And I just happened in my quiet time to come across this verse. And so I, and I'm going to have the verse up here for you because I feel like you, as young adults, some of you are in seasons in life where you need scripture to just cling to and say, okay, God, I don't know what to pray on my own. I don't know what to do on my own. But here, here's where my heart's at. So I found this scripture, and I just prayed it as I was praying getting ready to leave. I I went to um, school in Minneapolis. So as I was getting ready to leave Minneapolis or getting ready to leave college and start my life as a grown-up, this is what I prayed. It's Psalm 119, 31 through 35, the Living Bible Translation. It says, I cling to your commands and I follow them as closely as I can. Lord, don't let me make a mess of things. 
If you will only help me to want your will, then I will follow your laws even more closely. Just tell me what to do, and I will do it, Lord. As long as I live, I'll wholeheartedly obey. Make me walk along the right paths, for I know how delightful they really are. And I prayed that over and over and over, and I, I actually, I was in Minneapolis as a teacher. It was my that was what my degree was in. I didn't want to leave Minneapolis. I wanted to stay there and I wanted to teach uh, because I don't know why it's freezing there. It's a beautiful city, but it's freezing. But I had a lot of friends and I had a boyfriend. So I don't want a different boyfriend, which I know I'm making myself sound really boy crazy. And I kind of was. But, but again, I was a good girl. So... Anyway, it's okay, but this, so I had this boyfriend, didn't want to leave, didn't want to leave Minneapolis, wasn't getting a job. Here's the prayer I'm praying, when all of a sudden, a professor said to me, um, Jill, there is a school and a church in Rockford, Illinois, and I really feel like it's a big, big church, lots of young people, great school. I really feel like that might be a good fit for you. You should apply for a job, and I thought, okay, I have have nowhere else to go or to be or don't know where I should be, so sure. So I called the school. They said, we're very sorry. There are no job openings at this time, but you're welcome to pick up an application. So it just so happens, you know, I pack my car because I can't stay in Minnesota anymore. I don't have a job. I pack my car to move home, and at home is... Cleveland, Ohio. So as you drive, yay, I like that. Cleveland, Ohio. Woohoo. As you're driving from Minneapolis to Cleveland, Rockford, Illinois is right off the interstate. So I pulled off, I pulled up to this school. I go in, ask for an application. It's a Friday. They're about to offices are about to close for the weekend. And they said, "Well, Um, Here is an application, yes, but oddly enough, we just had a teacher call us today, and she said that she found out she's having twins, so she's not coming back in the fall. She doesn't feel like she can handle twins and sixth graders, so do you want to teach sixth graders? And at first I went, oh, sixth grade? Ah, I don't know that I can do sixth grade, and uh, I'd always seen myself as, you know, little kids teacher, but I thought, well, no, I want to I wanna interview. They asked if I want to interview. So I came back in Monday. I interviewed. They offered me a job on the spot, and it was one of those moments where I just knew, like, I knew in that moment, God, this is where I am supposed to be. It was like the peace of God in a weird way that I hadn't necessarily, I shouldn't say I hadn't sensed it before, but I'd sensed it again. This peace came over me, and thank you, Jesus, for his guidance and his direction. It's in Rockford, Illinois. And, and it's funny because I said at first I didn't want to teach sixth grade, but then by the time that school year started, I could not wait. I was so excited to meet those sixth graders. And not only that, but that's where I met my husband. It's where I met one of my best friends in the world who's here today. And then my lovely sister-in-law, you guys, I've got some pretty special people in my corner. So can you just, just because, I don't get to do this much. Will you just clap for my good girlfriends? Yeah. I'm going to pray. And I promise you this. When I leave tonight, I'm going to pray you all have some really good friends that push you to Jesus, that support you, that pray for you. Because, man, you need it. You need it. So I land in Rockford, I meet Sean, I I really will go on. You're like, okay, these stories are, I'm okay, I meet Sean, which the fact that we are married today honestly is a miracle, not kidding. When we were meeting with the pastor who did our pre-marriage counseling, he honestly, after looking at personality tests we were taking, we had taken, he said, you guys are so different that if you don't figure out how to meet in the middle, I think you should postpone your wedding and, and work some things out. Seriously. So the fact that we are married is a God miracle in and of itself, but uh, we, it, it's, it's all good. We, we made the right decision. We made it here. We're, we're not going anywhere. But um, So now I'm fast-forwarding one more story. 
And, and I'll tell you why I'm sharing this story shortly. Well, actually, no, I'll tell you why now. <laughs> this is one of those stories where it is like a, 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 a dramatic God story. And when you hear it, it's one of those stories where you can't help but go, whoa, God. And I hope that as I tell it, that you just go, Jesus, I want stories like this, but of my own. I want more of, of, of you. And so you, and here's, here's why I feel a little bad. You've heard this story before because Sean's told it. However, we all know that like, girls tell stories different than guys. He didn't tell it quite how I would tell it. So I'm going to tell it my way. I will not share as many details. And some of you may have heard it because if you were at the women's conference, I shared it. But as most of you know, this last year, our oldest son was um, real sick. He came back from Africa. He got really sick with an undiagnosed virus bacteria. We had no idea. And we were in the hospital for five days, very uncertain. Um, it, we just didn't know what was going to happen. And on day five, and, and it was a life-threatening illness. If, if you haven't heard this story, it was a life-threatening illness. And there's actually so many little God moments leading up to this day five that I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail to share because here's the big moment. Here's the moment I want you to hear, and I want you to go, oh, I just want you, God. Day five, I had said to a friend, I said, I feel like this virus is just has us on an emotional roller coaster because some days he's okay some days he looks like he's getting better and then other days he's crashing and we don't know if he's going to live we don't know what's going to happen so I feel like I'm on this emotional roller coaster that day five as doctors did their rounds they said we are ruling out a, B, C, X, Y, Z, the tests are negative. Ruling those things out, we're still looking. Not too long after the doctors left, um, Sean and I, we were in a place we were feeling overwhelmed, so we had asked that people not come and visit. We were just, we were, we were, we were exhausted. But nurses came to our room and they said, there's a couple that's here. They want to see you. Is it okay if they come in? And I thought Sean would say, would send them away. I thought he'd say, sorry, we're tired, but he didn't. He said, let them come in. And so this couple came in and they said, we feel like God wants us to pray for your son. We didn't know if you'd let us in or not, but we just had to obey. So here we are. Can we pray for your son? Well, of course. What are we? we yes. So I will never forget this prayer. The gentleman laid his hand on my son, and he's praying all kinds of things that only the Spirit of God could have whispered to his heart. And he was saying these, all these things that he never would have known about my son. But here's what stood out to me most. He said, as he had his hand on my son, he said, bacteria, he started to speak to the bacteria. He said, bacteria, you have been playing with us for too long now. You cannot play with us any longer. You have been hiding from us. You cannot hide any longer. You need to raise your hand. You need to tell us who you are. And I thought, well, that is such a strange prayer to pray. <laughs> but I'll take it. Side note, ladies and gentlemen. And I said this at the women's conference, but I'll say it again. You can be specific in your prayers, but you can also speak to the issue and say, in the name of Jesus, no. You have no authority. You have no power in Jesus' name. You, as a believer in Jesus, as a, as a son, as a daughter, you have that authority to speak directly to the issue and tell it no. So that's his prayer. He tells this virus it can't hide, can't play with us. An hour later, the doctors come into our room and they say, you're not going to believe this, but we know that this morning we told you we ruled out malaria. However, we found malaria. Then he said his words, and he wasn't there when the guy prayed. 
He said, it's as if it was hiding from us. Right? Then he went on to say, I went and personally thanked the technician myself because finding another doctor piped in and the doctor said, finding this bacteria was, as, was like finding a needle in a haystack. That's how difficult it was to find. And I tell you that story again because I say, it's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. And I don't want you to sit in here and go, well, Jill, that's good for you. I'm glad. I'm glad you see God working and moving in your life. That's not my intent. I don't want you to leave here with a heaviness of heart, a heaviness of spirit. I want you to leave encouraged. I read just this week. I was reading just not because I was looking for a message, just my own. It's where I was at in my Bible. <laughs> I was reading in Acts. It's the story of the Apostle Paul. And one thing I noticed about Paul, and this is why also I've shared all these stories with you. One thing I noticed about Paul, every audience he had, whether it was an audience of one, whether it was an audience of two, or a small group, or whether it was a large audience, every opportunity that he had, he shared his story. He shared his past. He shared his dramatic dramatic um, introduction to Jesus. And then he started to talk about all the ways he'd seen God work and move and the miracles that had been done. Every audience. And I, in one instance, it just caught, it, it, it was so fascinating to me as he's speaking to Caesar. Caesar said, are you telling me all of this? Are you trying to get me to be a Christian? And he said, essentially, he said, Actually, I want you to have what I have. So, yeah, I want you to hear me and to want the God of my life. And that's, that's this moment. I just want all of you to want the God that years ago I said yes to. And here's what else just fascinated me about Paul's story. I'd never seen this before. I'd never seen it before. It's going to come up on the screen. This is Acts 22. It says, the God of our ancestors, I'm sorry, let me give you a little background here, okay? There's, Paul gives his life to Jesus it's a crazy story. You need to read it on your own. He's actually blinded in that moment. But God speaks to a man named Ananias and tells Ananias, you go to Paul. He's blind right now. He needs you to speak into his life. He needs you to pray for him. Go to Paul. So Ananias did. And then this is where we pick up. And this is what Ananias said to Paul. He said, the God of our ancestors has handpicked you to be briefed on his plan of action. You've actually seen the righteous innocent, and you've heard him speak. You are to be a key witness to everyone you meet of what you've seen and heard. So what are you waiting for? Get up, get yourself baptized, scrub clean of those sins, and personally acquainted with God. Like, if I could just right now, if I could be like an Ananias to you, and say to every single one of you, you, you have been handpicked by God. You have been handpicked by God. So what are you waiting for? Get yourself, you're, you, you were handpicked by God for such a time as this. So what are you waiting for? Get yourself personally acquainted with God. It's in that place of getting yourself personally acquainted with God that your, your faith will grow. You'll begin to trust his character. You'll begin to um, see him in ways you've never seen him. Your love, your love for him will grow. You'll begin to see and sense and realize and understand his love for you. And I want to say to you, I, 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 I know I've said, I've told you all kinds of stories, and I don't want you to go, oh, she has lived her life perfectly, and that's why she's seen God do these things. You guys, I have not lived my life perfectly. I have not obeyed perfectly. I have not trusted God perfectly. In fact, I almost didn't come tonight. 
It almost didn't happen. And list of reasons, but if I'm being honest, I was really struggling to trust God in the moment. I was struggling to trust him for tonight. I haven't prayed perfectly. Remember how I said words are hard for me? I find that to be true even in my prayer time. I haven't prayed for hours and hours and hours as you might think. I've just little by little by little showed up. Slow and steady. The one common denominator in my life is, is I met Jesus a long time ago. And I just decided to get personally acquainted with him. And I said, God, I'm not going anywhere. When Ethan was sick, it was at the height of his, at the height of fear for me, at the height of uncertainty. And I remember I found a place, I I went to the bathroom at the hospital because nobody was in there. And I said, God, I don't know what's going to happen. But no matter what, No matter what, God, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here with you forever, no matter what. A life with Jesus, it's it's slow, it's steady, one step at a time, one day at a time. And I actually, this morning, I just wrote a bunch down because I thought, you know what? I, I want to say this, and I don't know if I will remember to, so it's going to come up on the screen. It says this. It says, life's a journey, slow and steady. God journeys it with us if we'll let him. Sometimes we'll see the big dramatic miracle moments, but more often than not, as you look back, you'll see that it was his steady, immovable hand that made the greatest impact. There have been constant never ceasing glimpses of him and his faithfulness all throughout my life. And, and I'm, if I'm being honest, they've come, they come in waves sometimes, or sometimes there's very dry seasons. And for a very long time, I don't hear, I don't see, I don't feel. I question. But can I tell you, if that's you, it's all normal. It's normal stuff. If I could be so bold as to implore you tonight to say choose Jesus choose him and then just resolve to remain in that place of relationship with him get to know his character I had somebody ask me well there's all these promises in the Bible how do I know which ones are for me and how do I know which ones are not and I got it because God promised Abraham and Sarah they'd have a baby in their old age so I'm I've prayed that prayer. God, give us another baby in our old age. Sean would, oh, he'd get rid of me if that actually happened. No, he wouldn't, but so, but I got it. I was like, yeah, how, how do you know which promises to hold on to for you and which promises are meant for somebody else like Sarah and Abraham? I don't know. I don't know exactly, but here's what I do know. Every promise that you find in the Word of God that speaks to God's character, that speaks to who He is, that is a promise that you can hold on to always and forever. So I want to read one last time this verse. But here's, I saw this, and I didn't put it in my notes because I I missed it. I'm going to read one more time, Acts 22, 14 through 16. But I'm going to back up a little bit. When Ananias was, had come to Paul and was going to pray for him, Paul said this. He said, he came and he put his arm on my shoulder. Look up, he said. I looked, this is Paul talking. I looked and I found myself looking right into his eyes. I could see again. So if you would for a minute, I know I can't see all of your eyes, but if you could look at my eyes, if I could put my hand on every single one of your shoulders, I would look you right in the eye and I would say to you, you've been handpicked by God. You have been handpicked. 
You've seen stories of Jesus. You've heard my stories. And I know that so many of you have stories of your own. Start sharing them. Start telling people. Write them down so that you never forget. You. You are to be a key witness in the story of Christ. You have what it takes. You have what it takes to point people to Jesus. So what are you waiting for? If you have not yet made a decision, if you haven't made a decision to have a relationship with Jesus, allowing him to scrub you clean of sin, well, guess what? You're going to have an opportunity here in a minute to do that. Start today. Do your best to get acquainted with God, personally acquainted with God. And again, no guilt, no shame here, guys. We are imperfect people pursuing a perfect God. It's just slow. It's steady. I think I couldn't have been more honored by your introduction of consistent because really, guys, maybe the biggest miracle of my life is the fact that somehow God's helped me to be consistent. That's it. That's it. Trusting Jesus looks like this, guys. Real practical. Trusting Jesus is this. Every day saying, Jesus, I cast this care upon you for I know you care for me. I cast this care upon you because I know you care for me. Over and over and over and over again. Every day. Every day. Every day. Every day. Jesus, I can trust you because I know who you are and I know who I am. It takes time. But don't give up. You have what it takes. And you were created for such a time as this. The world needs you, young adults. Oh, and how he has good things for you. So let's pray. We're going to close in prayer, okay? Before I go on, before I pray and we start to worship, I want to ask, is there anyone here who you say, you know what? I have not. I have not given my life to Jesus, but I recognize that I have stuff in my life, junk, that I want to be free of. I want to be clean. I want to be whole. Well, you cannot do that on your own, but Jesus paid the price for you. So if you're here and you say, I want to be done with the past junk, I want to make Jesus my Lord and Savior, if you would raise your hand, we're going to pray together. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So group, we're going to be good friends tonight. We're going to pray with our friends who just raised their hand. And so if you would, just repeat after me a prayer. We're going to do that together, and then I will pray for you, and then we'll worship, okay? So here we go. Jesus, thank you for your great love for me. Thank you that you paid the price that I couldn't pay. Thank you for making me clean and whole and new. I want to live my life alongside you. Thank you that I can trust you. Now, Father, I pray for this amazing group of young adults. God, I thank you because your word says that you who begun a good work is faithful to complete it. And so where this group of young adults has said, here I am, Lord, use me, send me, help me. Oh, I pray that you would come in to their life and into their world like a flood. I pray that they would see you helping them. I pray that they would see you guiding them. I pray that they would see you using them, big ways, small ways. I pray that you would just do what only you can do in the, in the way of the miraculous. But I pray that you would give them wisdom and insight and eyes to see both big miracles and small miracles. I pray that you would fill them with resolve to just remain in your presence, to remain with you, 
Oh, I pray that they would, as they pursue you, I pray that you would open the eyes of their heart and flood them with light that they could see you clearly and that they could share you with the world. Fill them with your love. Fill them with a love for you that spills out and into the lives of every person they meet. May they be a genuine reflection of your heart for the world to everyone they meet. In Jesus' name, amen.